Sergeant John Michael Matty, United States Army Rangers, Vietnam. Sergeant Matty served with the 1st Battalion, 28th Infantry, 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam in 1966. He was wounded three times and he received the Silver Star for his actions. Sergeant Matty's story is one of the most gripping ones that I've recorded over the years and I interviewed him February 16th, 2007 in Petersburg, Virginia. He was 61 years old. Sergeant Matty passed away 2017 at the age of 71. I'd like to thank Michael Donovan for making this story possible. Michael, thank you for becoming involved and making it possible for many people to hear John Matty's story today. I salute you, sir. If you'd like to become involved with this project, please contact me. There's information in the video description and in the comment section. And folks, history is best learned from those who were there. And I've been fortunate over the years to gather over a thousand stories from World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, Iraq, and Afghanistan. These are first-hand accounts of what happened. And many thousands of you have been watching and subscribing. And I would encourage you to subscribe to this channel because these stories are being released now at a pretty good pace. I've got a thousand of them. If you want to get involved, like it says, with helping me, just get a hold of me. But you know, every page of history lost, these stories become more precious and valuable. And folks, we're fighting for the same freedoms in our own country that our veterans fought for in foreign soul. So I encourage you, I challenge you, and I thank you for watching these videos and sharing them. And I'm happy to present to you now John Maddy, Sergeant John Michael Maddy, Vietnam. God bless you. Rod and other leg, and it was hectic. But that operations, that I said Vietnam, because I was gung ho. I was I went 20 years old. I was in the military. I was in Germany four and a half years before I even went to Vietnam. But I was gung ho. Vietnam was nothing to the after effect. You know the surgery you go through, uh, mental. We're going to touch on that. First thing I want to ask you is what, what year did you go to Vietnam? 1966. Okay, how old were you then? 20. So you're 20 years old, you were drafted, you got no. enlisted? No, I enlisted. Why did you go, why did you go into the military? Uh, well, uh, back then, you either went in the military or if you wanted something out of life, and all of my family was military, but they was Navy. I was the first one who went in the Army, and I'm really glad I did. Did you feel a real sense of duty to serve your country? Yes. Yes, very much. What was the mood of your peers, your classmates, your friends at that time? Were they encouraging you to go? Were they wanting to go? I mean, oh, yes. I had quite a few friends that uh, it was eight of us went in together. Mm -hmm. How many came and, back? myself. Wow. So you're 20 years old, you're in basic training. Uh, where'd you go to basic at? Fort Gordon, Georgia. So when you got there and you started your training, were you think, was your mind thinking ahead to, I'm going to be in combat pretty soon, or what were your no, thoughts? No. It was really uh, a gung-ho type, you know, because I always wanted to go uh, basic, uh, AIT, uh, airborne, go through the Rangers which I, I did because I went through extensive training. Mm -hmm. But I was really the gung-ho person, you know, to go after that because it meant something to me and to prove to my family I could be somebody. Do you think that your experience in the military changed you? I mean, yes. for the better? Uh, mentally, in a lot of ways, I say yes. Uh, physically, no. 
but uh, physically uh, far as food, because I was a very choosy person on eating things, but Vietnam experience, you know, for anybody, it really educates you on uh, eating because when I went there from Germany, I weighed 198 pounds. When I came back from uh, Vietnam, I weighed 106. So, I mean, it, it, <laughs> It was very, very rough. So how old are you now? <coughs> I'll be 61 in March. Okay. And just, just tell me about, um, again, in basic training, you weren't thinking ahead? Or did you know you were going to go to Vietnam? No, no, we uh, never heard of Vietnam. I went through basic training in the early 60s, okay. very early. And, uh, well, you never heard well, anything then, okay. about it. I thought you went in. What year did you go to Vietnam, though? 66. Okay, so you were already in. What rank were you at that time? Spec, uh, well, I was spec four when I went to uh, Vietnam. Can you tell me what you remember about arriving in country the first time, what you felt, what you smelled, what, what it was like? Uh, well, it was a lot of jungle. <laughs> but uh, when we got off the planes, well, I'll go back to Germany. When I was in Germany, I was small trains weapons expert. And... I thought I knew every weapon it was. And when we got off the plane in Vietnam, the first thing they do is hand you your gear or what you're going to have. And they handed me M16, said, y'all going in field in an hour. And I never seen that M. <laughs> I've never seen it before in my life. Uh, but you learn quick, very fast. So. Is it like a baptism under fire? I mean, do you feel invincible and then bullets start flying? Or is this your first time in combat in Vietnam? Yes, it was the very first time. So, do you remember your first time and what happened? And uh, just describe the scene, where you were at. Well, the very first combat that I seen was in the uh, rubber plantation. Uh, I think it was like 30 miles north of Saigon. And uh, it was a right heavy battle. and. I mean, bullets flying everywhere. It, it was just like, you know, you see, you know, average wars on TV. I mean, you know, bombs going off and just everything. And when you hear them bullets whizzing or hitting the ground, I wanted to dig a hole. I didn't have a shovel, but, but I mean, that's the way it is. And I, we were charging a village. And uh, that's when I fell in a punji pit. First time. <laughs> This was the first time you were injured? Yes, sir. What happened when you fell in the punji pit? What, what, what was going on? Uh, well, it's covered with grass, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, it has bamboo sticking up with, you know, all kind of foliage in it. And they ran through my legs and stuff, and then a couple guys had pulled me out. Were you evacuated at that time or not? It was, well, not right, you know, right at that time. That Then they take you out and you go, our main medical support was third field. And I was put there and I think I was there maybe six, seven days. They cleaned the wounds out, they started healing. If you're not bad, you're back in the jungle. But you weren't that bad. So you went back? Yes. Uh, now, were you, what was your rank, did you say, specialist? Specialist, and I made so like Eve. Corporal or what? Spec four, yes. So are you uh, in command of anybody or? A squad? Or? Uh, quite a bit, yeah, quite, quite, a, quite a bit. I had uh, my command, well, uh, captain, he was my ranger command, commander in Germany, and he came, I guess I've been in country about six months, and he came over there, and I thought he was the baddest human being that walked. And uh, he did everything I told him to do because he'd never been in combat before. And that's one thing that did, everybody was close enough that if you knew something, they listened. That, you know, we depended on each other very much. The camaraderie was great? Yes, yes. Did you have friends that you, you, you showed me some medals that you lost that were killed or wounded? Throughout your one tour of Vietnam, is that what you Yeah, did? one. I had uh, 13 days left mm -hmm. last time I was wounded. So, um, just, you know, and as you talk, I'm just trying to think about all these things that you did. Were, did you involve yourself, were you involved with any of the helicopters going in and out of it? Oh, yes. Yeah, we, uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, you could, uh, they'd give you a medal uh, 
for so many hours. You know, you had to keep up with your hours on a helicopter. Well, in our unit, we we did a lot of recon, which I told you before that uh, a bunch of us would go out and recon. We find the enemy and such stuff like that. But it helicopter. I mean, we was constantly on a helicopter. Off, it, it, I didn't have time. <laughs> You know, we're in, I wouldn't worry about no medals in the first place. So tell me about the role of the helicopter and what you remember about maybe going on a combat assault or whatever you did and landing in a, in a, in a landing zone. Uh, well, I mean, on uh, well Highway 1, which I've got pictures and different things, so I told you that uh, we flew in the battalion and it was really rough. I mean, you know, mortar, mortars was coming in, gun firing and everything else. And, you know, when you hit the ground, you hit the ground and start, you got to do what you got to do. And uh, it was right rough. It was really rough. So is it like the movies when you're getting in the helicopters and flying and they listening to music or no, probably not? Well, we had uh, a general, because I did a lot around command. And we had this one-star general, and his name was General Gene. He carried two Pearl Handle 45s, and he loved listening to music. I think he was like that one movie they had out <laughs> there that, uh, I mean, he was cool, but he would lead the charge. I mean, he'd come off that helicopter, and he's the first one to hit the ground, and you had to follow the man because he had guts. He had a lot of guts. So on a, on a pickup, where were you at, and what were you doing? And I mean, you're flying on these Huey helicopters? Right. How many troops on a helicopter? Oh, average, uh, say, nine. Nine per You had two gunners, and then you know, all of us. So when you fly ones. into a landing zone, what, what's being said? What's happening? Is there uh, gunfire going on? or what, what do you oh, oh, yeah, a lot of gunfire. I mean, we had them hitting the Hueys. Uh, your mind is not... I don't even think it's on death. It's to get to the ground. Uh, we've had a number of times we had to jump out before the helicopters could even hit the ground because they was getting so much fire. And yeah, I mean, it, it was rough. It, it, it had good points, but it had a lot of bad points. So would, would you jump off first, or who goes off first? And Whoever's at the door. Because you had a gunner on each side, they was mounted with M60, M60s, and uh, as soon as they said go, I mean, you went as fast as you could go, you know, to get on the ground. So you're, you're, is that called an insertion when you're when you're put into an area like that? Or? Yes. And, and then what happens? Do you go to a certain place and rendezvous, or how, what happens after that? Uh, well, your command force, uh, they set up a perimeter and, you know, clean out a perimeter and so forth and stuff like that. And if you have known enemy, you know, at a certain point, then we go in and re recon and go to the enemy. Explain what reconnaissance is. Uh, well, it's a group of people. A lot of times they'd have a group of eight. It, it varies, I guess, on your different commands, how many persons it would be, but mm -hmm. they would have uh, where you'd go out if they... Uh, say a village was at a certain point, and they said, well, it's known VC in this area, and we want it recon. Well, that's what we done. We reconned and checked around, seeing what it was. If it was, then force come in, full force. It was dangerous? Very much, yes. Very Were much. these like elite troops in, in the recon groups? or? Uh, what, you mean us? Yeah. Um, not really. I mean, we were trained to do our job. I knew my job, and what was your job? Uh, to recon the enemy. If I found the enemy, kill him. Is that something they train you to do when you go through? I mean, do they put a killer instinct in you, or how, yes. how do they do that? Uh, part that's part of me that really hurts. Mm -hmm. You know, now is. There, you know, all your military, whether it be, you know, Navy, Air Force, or whatever it is, when you go through training, your, tra your mind is military. Your brain functions on what you have to do. And it ain't like, you know, just like you put your mind, well, I'm going out on a date. You put your mindset, if, if it's uh, 
saying they're saying, well, you have to go out on recon today and it's known VC in area. Your mind is blocked to everything else. And I mean, that's where I was. I'm not going to say everybody else, that's me. And you put it in to do your job. And I think the majority of troops or uh, my brothers who was with me, we did our job. And, and the people in the United States didn't understand that. Right. When you were over there fighting, did you, were you conscious of God and country or were you fighting for survival? Well, I believe in God. I believe in my country. I love my country. I don't want, uh, I wouldn't want no war here. Uh, it took me a long time in Vietnam before I really understood because they tried to keep the news, you know, from what people were saying and things that was going on back in the States away from us so we couldn't hear it, which is a good thing because I don't think people could do their job you know, if we'd have known different things that was going on also. But uh, I, did, I, I did my job. I love my country and I, I did it for that. I don't believe the Vietnamese really knew what they wanted. They had coups, uh, you know, military taking over. And, you know, you're there because you want to free a nation to be free. And it's a mess. It's a mess out to me right now. Um, how, how would you define combat? I mean, how would you define it? What would you say about combat? Hell. But I think God put us here to help each other, to try to help each other so people can be free and, you know, to live the right way, not be controlled by any type government or a human being that says, you're going to do what I tell you to do, which I think is wrong. And I think that was my biggest motive on really in Vietnam is because I've seen children starve to death. Uh, I've seen little kids kill. Uh, that hurts. You know, and, and just wanting to do things for people and help them be free, and because I love being free myself. So this is one of my questions at the end. But w w what does freedom mean to you? Uh, enjoying life, uh, having freedom of speech, uh, seeing that love that you can give to each other, people. Uh, I've taught my daughter, uh, just like food, you know, I was telling you, that uh, a lot of times she'd like to waste food. And uh, I told her one example in Vietnam, she started crying, that uh, I said, you know, I've seen two little children, my uh, stepdaughter's seven right now, and I said, I've seen two that one may have been eight or nine and one maybe 12. And we have pits, like only main food we had was our sea rations or whatever. We had uh, canned spaghetti, spam, things like that, eggs. And eggs was always half rotten and stuff. Well, they dig a pit and they just throw it all in the pit, you know, what people don't have stuff. Well, I seen the one cut the other one's throat to get the food. And I can understand it. But I said, that's what gives me something here to, that educated me as far as food. Because back in the States, you know, people, you know how people are today that uh, are very wasteful. And I mean, it hurts me to see that. Before I went to Vietnam, no. And that's one good thing I'll say about the military. It teaches you. It's, uh, it's on the job training. And it does teach you to respect life, to respect food, you know, to, just different things that you can hold here.
Wow. Um, as far as the missions and things you're doing, are, we, are you fighting? I know the answer to this, but just, you know, the, what, who are we fighting in Vietnam? The North Vietnamese, the, v, the VC? Uh, well, the VC from the north was our enemy, but we had the pajama boys. And that was infiltrated by, through the north, that you had a lot of South Vietnamese that was with them. And we call them pajama boys because that's, that's the way they were. Uh, Silver City and that rubber plantation I was talking about, uh, that's what we was hit by, pajama boys. And they drugged themselves up, I mean really totally drugged up. They'd have tourniquets around their arms, hand, you know, wrist, uh, knees, and I mean, a lot of times you had to shoot quite a few times to put them down on the ground. It's it's because they were so drugged up. But just like I said, war is hell, and that's what it is, hell. Now you were wounded how many times? Three times. Okay, I'm reading the note here. Tell me about. Uh, you told me yesterday. Um, Were you were a sergeant. Were you sergeant in the infantry? Yes. Okay. So you you had uh, men underneath you that you commanded, or? Uh, well, I'll go back to the battle. They the uh, on uh, I was wounded the sixth of May, 9th of June, and the sixth of November. Uh, the sixth of November, which was the last battle I was in, that uh, was called Attleboro on Bowden Mountain, right at the bottom. And we were surrounded by 2,200 North regulars. And the, uh, that was the worst one I ever been in my life. I mean, everywhere you looked, they was. Cause, I mean, they really had us surrounded. And uh, B Company, uh, they penetrated. They was coming through. And Colonel Whitty, which is my commanding officer, uh, sent myself in special, Ke uh, Kelly to go in and uh, start trying to pull out some wounded or see what was going on to do what we could do. And we did and I tr uh, the captain, his name was Pasilio. He was killed. He went, I didn't think he was dead. I tried helping him and uh, before I could get him back, he, he was dead. Uh, pulled quite a few of them out. But then he sent me back in there. Well, I couldn't get out because there was too many enemy. And uh, I started bandaging, bandaging uh, E7, or Sergeant E7, Master Sergeant. Uh, he was gut shot. And uh, I bandaged him up while well, they started coming at us. And I took over, it was nine of us left in B Company. And I didn't think I was gonna come back. I mean, you see boys, and I'll say boys, I, w I was really a boy myself at 20, uh, laying there, some of them would fire the weapons. Uh, I don't believe they had the right, tra uh, the maximum training, and dying like flies. Uh, it's rough. Was this when you were wounded again? Yes. Well, uh, tell me about this, I, my note that says, uh, I don't know if this is right. Was Whitty shot nine times or were you shot nine no, times? No, I, I was, uh, well, <coughs> we was running out of ammunition and I looked up, I, we was behind a bunch of sea rations and there was a load of them coming at us and I just got a glance of the Viet Cong and he shot me with AK-47 all the way across my chest. And, Blowed my arm almost off, and uh, I got stabbed in the back. Uh, then I waited, and I tried to get out. <laughs> Another guy shot me in my left arm, <laughs> and finally I just laid there for a little while until I there wasn't nobody around where I could see anything, and I made it back uh, approximately to where the command force was, and I think I passed out. Uh, because I was told, you know, after the fact, I remember them throwing me on the helicopters because that's one thing that I admire more the person is the chopper pilots 
Because number one, they weren't supposed to come in the area. If you got a fire zone or you got a battle, they're supposed to stay away. And they'd come in when we was throwing people. We'd grab a, whoever, if we thought they was alive, and sling them on there. And they'd make bounces. When they bounce, we'd throw people on and they'd boogie. Well, they threw me on. I remember that, but that's all. I, that's the only thing. But uh, after the fact, when I was in third field, it took me a while to even get my brain back, but they said it took me 28 units of blood on the field, and Colonel Whitty's one to save my life. He burnt me all up in my chest, the uh, fuse arteries, which, thank God. How did he know how to do that? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no. Do you remember him treating you in the field or not? No, no, none at all. I remember seeing him and hearing talking, but that's. So you were as far shot as in the chest and your your right arm and then your left arm and then you went unconscious basically. Well, I made it about forty yards until I when I collapsed, and then I think Colonel Whitty, from what Major Taylor told me, that uh, Colonel Whitty got shot in the stomach saving me, which I respected, man. He was one of the finest officers I've ever known. Was he killed? No, no. He's in uh, Florida. Oh, he is? He, yeah. What part of Florida? Right on the Gulf. Uh, I can't think of the name of this town. Is it South Florida? Uh, it's over where the circle, where the Gulf, they call it the Gulf. Do you ever talk with him or have you ever communicated with him? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, it took me a long time. I was trying to find people, trying to find people, and I never could find anybody because our, the battalion I was in, really, we almost got annihilated. We had to have napalm dropped on us to get the VC off. And uh, it took me a long time. Uh, Major Patton, it was, uh, I believe he was uh, General Patton's nephew, and he also retired as Brigadier General. He came to Walter Reed Hospital when I was there, and he's the one that told me that uh, Major Taylor and Colonel Woody survived. They, they came out alive. And I will wanted to say about Major uh, Patton, he was my best friend. He helped me a lot. I, I believe I helped him a lot, and he stayed with me a lot in and out of Walter Reed. Uh, he was last stationed at the Pentagon, and because I was in Walter Reed for almost three years, and uh, he was a very good man. But I did get in touch with Mayor Taylor. I went to see him, and uh, which I told you about a book they wrote, which I'm in too. Uh, I'm not proud. Of, uh, well, I'll try to tell my wife. I, I, this interview that I'm doing now, I've never done before. I never like talking about it because it brings back no bad memories. But just like I told her, I feel better now where I talk to her because I've never done it before, that it took a lot of pain away because I told her, you know, the, like I said, the military trains your brain to be a certain way. And we did a lot of things, I'll say maybe we didn't have to do. And I'm glad I got a lot of it out of me because it, it never, it'll never leave. It will never go away. I, I won't forget. But. It's a sense that here it feels better, you know, getting it out. I agree. Very much. So you were in Vietnam for a year? Yes, sir. Or 13 days shy? Of a year, yes. What, what happened 13 days before you got out? I mean, we were supposed to go home. Were you counting down the days? And well, I was, uh, well, this, this oh yeah, you count the days because prior See, when you're down to 20 days, you're not even supposed to be in the field. And me and Colonel Whitty, Colonel Whitty was a real short man. He was small like yourself, but he was a big, stocky guy. 
And uh, I mean, he loved, I, I ain't <laughs> bragging enough, but he loved me because he knew I knew my job and I was going to do my job. And uh, he, uh, the last one we was in was on Attleboro. And we was chasing pajama boys. And we'd been chasing, we had to stop at this area. We was, uh, setting up and they said, no land position, no foxholes, nothing. We're gonna have Hueys come in, pick us up, put us in front of them, and that's when we're gonna take care of them. And I told him, I said, Colonel, I said, look here, I got, I got less than 20 days here, I don't even wanna go. And he said, well, you know, the old, old saying is, two strikes, you're safe, and three, you're out, and you only got two. So I smiled at him and said, okay. But uh, I'd do anything. The man, he real good man. I respected him a lot. Um, so you were wounded, and then you went home. You no. No. <laughs> well, I, uh, when I was wounded, they you go to the third field, and uh, you see a lot of things at the third field. I told you that. Uh, I can remember I was awake on the table in third field and the uh, captain was going to cut my arm off because uh, that's the first thing they do in the first place. You know, if you're wounded and they say, well, it's gone, you know, they're going to take it off. They do the same with legs or anything else. I told him we couldn't do that. <laughs> I said, it's mine. I said, I want to keep it. I won't tell you what I said to him, why he wasn't going to cut it, but he, he, he didn't cut it off. But uh, I was at third field, I don't know how long it was, and then they transported me to uh, Alaska on C-130s. And I believe I was there for about a week and a half, and then from there I went to Walter Reed uh, Hospital in Washington, D.C., which I was there for three years. Three years? What are they doing? I mean... A lot of major surgery. <laughs> uh, 49. Uh, you know, 49 surgeries I've had since the day that I came back. Uh, was it all for your right arm? No, no. I've, this here, uh, the left arm, I had part of the bone blowed out and they had put steel plates, bone grass steel plates. Uh, they cut bone out of you, put it in there, put steel plates, heal, another, you know. Well, this had been operated on nine times because uh, it, the bone would get infected or sometimes your bone rejects and, you know, things like that. And you just go through a lot of surgeries. And this one here, uh, quite a few surgeries, you know, from the chest, going in, getting bone out. And because I was shot from about right here all the way, it just blowed everything out. I know this is going to sound dumb, but when you were shot, what did it feel like? And you obviously knew you were seriously wounded? Impact. Nine times and you weren't killed. How can that happen in their chest? That's amazing. I think God was with me. Uh, that's something I couldn't understand. Yeah, I'm glad you said it. You know, it's uh, being shot, you feel impact. I didn't really feel no pain until I got to Walter Reed Hospital. None. Zero. And I think it's because of impact, because everything you have in your body just goes numb. You know, it's like a killing factor that, but uh, I mean, uh, Colonel Willie's one that saved my life. I don't think if it wasn't for him, I would have been dead. But uh, yeah, impact. So um, do you go into shock at a time like that or do you realize that? I've seen happened? people, I've seen people go in shock. I've seen uh, one boy, Jesse, a friend of mine, he got shot one time right here in the upper part of the leg. Didn't hit no bone and just went through his leg and he kept looking at it. Five minutes later, he was dead. He went, he just, you know, he basically went in the shop. But I mean, you have people that do that. And I guess some that you don't. It's and you're shot nine times, is this, did you see who was shooting you or what? Oh, I, I looked, looked him right in the face when he shot me with an AK. Did he just jump out of nowhere or what? Oh no, they was coming from everywhere. That was, on that battle, it was 2200, which, see, your regular uh, from the north, they had everything we had. 
I mean, mortars, machine guns, you name it, they had the same thing we had. And uh, they were well prepared, <laughs> very much so. Did you kill him or what happened? No, I didn't get to kill him. I, I run out of all the ammunition. I was shooting, uh, I had my 16 plus 45. I shot everything we had, and it wasn't but nine of us anyway. So, but uh, I mean, I run out of ammunition, and, and what can you do? <laughs> I started shooting a mortar. We jumped down in the hole and started shooting a mortar. <laughs> I've never even had mortar training, but we were shooting it, you know, trying to get them off. So you were shot, did you fall to the ground at that time? I kind of flew to the ground, because <laughs> it's a it's, it's right big impact. And, uh, but like I said, I didn't even know I, my arm was even almost gone. All I had was a little piece of meat. And the arm was behind my back, and I didn't even know I had it until I was trying to get up. And I got stabbed, and uh, I got shot in my other arm. That's the reason I said I laid there for a little while before, you know, you got time. stabbed in the back after you were shot? Yeah. So where were you at and what happened? I mean, you had fallen to the Just laying, yes. And somebody just came up and stabbed you? Yeah. It's, it, I'm, just like I said, they were... I always said that you, I, we, we call them gooks, uh, was like rats. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's just like, you know, army rats coming. And they was just everywhere. 2,200, it was 500 and some of us. That's it's quite a few. So he, somebody just came up and jabbed you or was trying to kill you? Well, I didn't even know I was stabbed in the back until I was in the uh, field hospital and found out I was. And then you got shot in the left arm? Right. One time? Or? Uh, twice. Yeah. Uh, got two bullet holes and it just shattered the bone, blowed the bone out of the arm. I don't know how you could not go into shock and just, that's amazing. Well, I don't either. I, I, uh, what were you? Do you remember what your thoughts were at the time? Were you thinking about home or anything or what? I mean, uh, I really couldn't say. I, I, it was just that I wanted to go home. I knew that. You know, it, it's. I think every person that was there had that on their mind. You know, they wanted. You know, you live through this certain period and then you want to get out. You know, give you a free span, you know, where you don't have. Because you, I, I, I was telling my wife, at, at 13, 16, 17 hours a day, that's, that's hard on a human body. And, and I've had people, you know, tell me, well, I know veterans out here from Vietnam. They ain't never been wounded, ain't a thing wrong with them. And they're drawing a disability. They shouldn't be drawing nothing or blah, blah, blah. Me, as a Vietnam veteran, not because I'm wounded or shot or anything, any human being that was in Vietnam, that was in combat, that went through the stuff that we went through, has got a disability. And some of it major. I mean, I've got friends. Uh, I don't know why I didn't. When I first came back, he doped like it was going out of style for pain, because everywhere hurt. <laughs> I mean, you eat, eat people. But I've had friends that are alcoholics, on drugs, and I'm not saying it's right, because I'm not in, you know, their circumstance or what they had to do, or, or things. I know myself, I want to live. And I said, you know, in dealing with the pain I have now, I have pain 24 hours a day. But in my mind, I said, if you keep busy or try to do something, you get your mind off of it. And it helps a lot to just trying to keep busy doing things. It helps, huh? Yes. Yeah. So it's like chronic pain, huh? Well, I mean, when you got steel knee and steel rods in your legs and steel in your arm and, you know, all this up in here and then arthritis, because the older you get, the more arthritis you get to go with it. And, and it, it's really hard, because sometimes I can't even pick up a cup of coffee. Now, this arm, I can't get to do nothing. I mean, I can move my hand and things like that. But the arthritis and stuff, I mean, you go to pick up a coffee, you can't get it off the... But, I mean, you do, you try to adapt. And the one friend, real good friend, he passed away two years ago. He had it real bad, because he didn't want to adapt. It's, and it's sad. And, you know, he always talked about the people back here. 
uh, the anger mm -hmm. of what they had to us and things. And I said, you just got to turn your head. That's what I did, basically. I mean, at first, I mean, it's almost a hatred, you know, to be there and, and to do things for your country. You know, what your country wants you to do, whether you're drafted or you join, you know, whatever. You're doing what this country wants. And then to come back and what you go through when you come back, it's really sad. Did you go through that or did others go through that? Because you're in the hospital, right? Uh, well, when I got off uh, C-130, when we came in from Alaska, because we was on C-1, we was on like flat cots, everybody with different ones wounded and stuff. And it's like a troop car. And they had the bed comes down, C-130 on the back. And uh, I looked out, and it might have been about 200 people out there, and I just, you know, wondered, because I was on morphine too, where they shoot you with morphine. But I was looking, I said, you know, it's really nice. But when they started taking us out on cots, everybody was shouting, baby killers, dope heads, uh, burning the American flag, and hurt. That's when hurt set in. It, uh, I said the saddest part, because I, I do more reading now than I've ever really done in my life. On all your wars, I don't believe any war has been unjust as Vietnam, as far as your people that served in Vietnam. As far as the home, people at home or just overall? A lot of people, I mean, even now, I've gone, and you see the hat I got on, and I'm proud of my hat that I served, just like I told you about different medals, that I am proud. I am no hero. I've never claimed to be a hero because uh, the Purple Hearts I received or the Silver Star or the, uh, the medals that I got through the South Vietnamese government, I got them from the battles we was in, and my brothers died. And that's what each one means. Each Purple Heart, I can name a lot of my friends. <laughs> that you never forget. Like you got him on behalf of them, right? I mean, yes. Um, I don't go. I went to the wall one time and I couldn't stay. It hurt me too bad. My uh, son-in-law, he's from Connecticut, and when I say you know the public and you know how they feel about people, uh, the Viet the ones that served there, and. He said, Butch, I want to take you to our wall in Connecticut. And I said, uh, Jamie, I don't think I could go because I don't, you know, it bothers me a lot. He said, You're gonna, it's really going to make you feel good. And finally, I think maybe after a week, because we was there a couple weeks, and he said, I want you to go. So I went with him, him and his daddy. They had well, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and they had Vietnam and which we didn't have the golf part then. And as you go through it, it has the walls, different walls of the, the men that died. But yet, what you walk on are brick. Every brick has got a name of a person that came back. And they call it the walk of life. And, you know, here, that touched me more than anything I've ever experienced in my life. Because it's good to look at a wall, the hurt, you have the hurt knowing that your brother's died. But then, you know, you got acknowledgement of the people that came back, that did just things what the government wanted. And 
it, it, it touched me more than my son-in-law could really imagine. Very much. What, what does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? Uh, freedom. Uh, the right to walk any place you want to walk. Uh, basically eat what you want. Uh, just do things. Be, be a free person. Freedom of speech. I believe it's wrong in groups that go out and say, well, I can burn the flag because it's freedom of speech. I do not believe it entitles you to burn a flag. I believe every person has a right to make a choice of what they want to believe in. But to me, a person that disgraces the flag or disgraces this country shouldn't be here. Because I think this nation is better than any nation around, any. I've been all over the world. I've, been, I've got Cuban friends that said if they picked up a Bible, they'd get shot. You can do anything you want here. You are free. And that's the purpose of the United States. Yep, that's exactly right. So you think having lost your friends is probably the hardest part for you as far as your memories? Or, I mean, is, is that it? I mean... Yeah. It's... I mean, it sticks to you. I, I had one friend that lived over in Chesterfield, and he went with me to Vietnam. I mean, well, he was in Germany with me when we was pulled out. And uh, we was on a recon, like I said, and I was talking to him one minute, and I heard a swoosh, and the next minute his head was on the ground. Uh, you can't forget things like that, and especially it's, it's hard you know, when you're in combat like that, because you do make friends, you got a bond. We had a bond between us. We protected each other. We took care of each other. And it's hard. That's why I say you don't have to be wounded. Everything is here. It stays there. And uh, VA put me on a medication, which I thank God they did, because if they hadn't, I think I'd kill a lot of people around here. Because you know, when people come up and say, you're a baby killer, I'm no baby killer. I killed a child, yes, I've, I've done that. I won't say the circumstances, but I have done it. But I'm not a baby killer. You're in the process. If, if uh, regardless, a human being comes at you with a hand grenade and getting ready to kill you, you're going to do what you've got to do, or you're going to do your job. That's what you're trained to do. I think I did my job well. Some cases, I think I did it too well. But that's what it is. But why come back here and people say you're a baby killer? Because you're, you're protecting your life or you're trying to protect others. That's what it is. If a person here, uh, even yourself, if you live beside a person and he's a rapist, are they going to judge you for being a rapist? And that's, that's what all Vietnam veterans got, not part, all. And that's the saddest part, I think the government didn't do their job. I'm not talking now, I'm talking back then, that they didn't help the veterans. They didn't say, look, they did what they was asked to do. Let's do for them the way what they've done for us, like you wore today, which I'm glad the government is doing what they're doing for the veterans. They should, it's time for them to do that. Life is short. So a lot of the Vietnam vets, they didn't, uh, had a hard time maybe transitioning back into civilian life because one day they were in combat, the next day they're home, and there was oh, yes. nothing to go through to help them, right? Right. I have a very good friend. He's from here in Petersburg. Uh, he served two tours in Vietnam. He come out of Mass, well, he didn't come out of Master Sergeant. He was Master Sergeant, but after his tours, they sent him to Germany. And in Germany, you go out to Grafenbeer, Hornsfeld, whatever, on doing training, you know, training exercise, stuff like that. His brain was too, gone too far. He didn't want to play games no more. I mean, it's, and it's true in anything, and that's why I said they got me on a medication now. Don't dope me up. It makes me think in my head. If a man comes up and smacks me, I'm going to say, well, why'd you do that? Before, I'd kill him. 
that's my fault of what I would do, which I'm glad for that, that they do have something like that. But he got in a uh, big uh, fight with his commanding officer, and he got dishonorable discharge. And it's really sad that the man had done his life, but up here he couldn't control it, you know, to play, you know, to do the game, what they call games. And I don't believe anybody can because it's there. It's not going to leave your body. Were there, were there drugs in Vietnam when you were there? And <laughs> I've seen a lot of movies back here. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, from my unit, my battalion, the people that I knew, I never seen no drugs. Never. And if I did, I'd never trust a man beside me to protect my life as well as I'm going to protect his if he's taking drugs. I won't say that people didn't have drugs, because I couldn't say, because I, I don't know how they was at different times at different periods. I know we didn't take no drugs. We depended on each other too much. What should people remember about Vietnam? What should they remember? That is a very hard question to answer because the only thing I would say that I would say hope they would remember or acknowledge is that the Vietnam veteran is a part of the military life as well as what it is today in the Gulf War. Each one of us was asked to do something, we did our job. And don't look at us like we're criminals or things, which there are people that have hard times and they got bad things that happen to them. But don't put them down in the dirt when they don't deserve it. I do not believe, I do not believe no man that's walked in Vietnam should be in the dirt. Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Yes, sir. Very much. Very much. Have people thanked you for your service? I've, I'd say in the last year, I've had a few people and, well, I mean, your military, one thing about your military, military stick together. And a lot of people say it's wrong. Well, you stick around, you know, the base camp over there and you got friends that's military. That's true because your military, they, each person understands. You got that bond, you know what I'm talking about. That you can be together, you can sit down and talk and things like that. And it's a big difference from your military than, you know, your civilian personnel. Because I've, I've gone out, my wife and I, and I've had a guy walk up to me, I don't like you, you from Vietnam, I'm gonna kick you. <laughs> and why? Because I wear this hat, hat that I'm proud of, that uh, not to say I kill people or things, because just like I told you, each one of them things means something to me. And it's not what I've done, it's what they done. So why, you know, have that kind of... You know, did you get the Silver Star? Yes. Can you tell me what you did to get that, the citation? Uh, tell me where you were, what happened, describe the scene. That was uh, the last battle, on Bowood, right down at the bottom of uh, Bowden Mountain on the border and it was called Attleboro. And Colonel Winnie said, like I said, he sent me in there to pull out a, try to help some wounded or find out what was going on, how the B Company going up, because the radio operator was killed. And uh, I pulled out, I don't know, six, seven, eight people, and I tried to say the captain uh, there and didn't get to because he, he died, which he got the Medal of Honor. And I got the uh, Silver Star, and from the South Vietnamese government, I got the uh, uh, can't think of that. It's the two highest medals they get from the South Vietnamese government. Uh, so you said you pulled guys out. I mean, that sounds pretty quick. What, what was happening? Were you under fire? Were you? Oh yeah. So describe it if you could a little bit more. I mean, the, the scene. Um, what what was happening, and then actually taking these guys out one at a time. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, if if 
But you know, like when uh, me and Kelly, it was Specialist Kelly, he was, he was a black boy and he was one of my best friends. And me and him went together. And I mean, we'd run in there where their area was and if we seen somebody win, we'd just grab them, throw them over the shoulder and bug back. And, and you know, uh, like a rebound, we'd carry ammunition. We carried loads of ammunition in there because, you know, trying to get it to them because we knew they was running out because, I mean, they was, Kong was everywhere. And uh, I don't know, I didn't even think it was scary then. It, it's just a thought, you know, you, you got a job and you try to do your job. And I had my brothers laying on the ground and I wanted to get them out. I'm sure there's a lot more we can talk about. I'm just about out of time, but um, I'm trying to think if there's something else here I wanted to ask you. Well, it's one thing I wanted to say. Yeah. Uh, in the third, uh, like I said, when a person was wounded, they went to the third field. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of people tell me not to say what I'm about to say. And I've had it on my mind a lot of my years, mm -hmm. you know, of thinking that uh, I've seen guys over there when I, the different times I was wounded. And it's one boy really particular that uh, he had a venereal disease, a major venereal disease, and he was just eaten up. I mean, you could see his insides where he was eating. Uh, he started screaming because uh, some people come in was getting him and he was screaming he didn't want to go. And I asked this other person that was like a medic or something like that. I said, what's going on? And he said, we're uh, going to take him to the island. And I said, what do you mean take him to the island? What island? What, what are you talking about? And they said, well, the, they got a place, if you get anything like that and it's incurable that we don't know what it is or something, we take them to the island and that's where they pass away. Mm -hmm. I said, you take a person to an island, just let them go. Uh, in the different times I've wounded, I've maybe seen 11 people that went away, but that boy really stuck to me when he screamed, you know, not wanting to go. And to me, uh, I said if I was uh, somebody's son or, you know, grandchild or something, and it was my father, Regardless, you know, guys did do things there. And even if they had a disease, it don't, should not give the government the right to put them away and say they're MI, MIAs and them people not knowing where their father or grandfather is. I believe they have that right. And if the government now knows, oh, <laughs> where that island is to go get their remains and bring them back to the family. I had in me that I hurt because I could see that boy. And I don't know what happened to him. I don't have the friends I do. But I would love to see, you know, if they could, wherever it is, to bring them home. Can I ask you to do one more thing? 
Yes. We're just we're out of time here. Um, and then I want to scan a few pictures, okay? At the end of my interviews, I always ask for the better and from where you're seated to give me a salute into the camera. When I tell you to, can you do that for me? Okay, go ahead. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Now stay there. I'm going to take a picture of us with this camera, okay? Okay.